I look forward to the day when the temple gates will open and we are there with Jesus in the New Jerusalem. <clears throat> in the meantime, last Sabbath, we shared with you Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Everybody came to a point where it was almost electrifying as the, as the people crested the Mount of Olives and the scene of the valley below with the city of Jerusalem there in its beautiful splendor and the temple standing out and flashing light, so to speak, from the sun glinting off of it just dazzled everyone and it even it heightened their, their experience of what was happening before them. They all knew that Jesus was going to be their king and they didn't care what the religious leaders said because to them it didn't matter what Rome might be thinking about or doing because if this one can make food this one can raise the dead this one can heal the leper it doesn't matter what Rome thinks it can do because he has already shown himself to do things that are totally impossible the Bible says that Jesus went on into Jerusalem telling after telling the, the religious leaders, if these people don't shout, the rocks will cry out. I praise God that they didn't stop shouting, though it was probably a little more of a somber mood from that point forward as they came into the city. But this began what we refer to today as the Passion Week. Jesus spent time in unique ways with the people, cleansed the temple. You know, we oftentimes hear about that, that rope that Jesus had in his hand and went about helping people realize that the wrong kinds of things were happening in the temple. The Bible tells us that the people fled before him as he turned over the tables of money changers and the, the, the temple shekels were scattered in the courtyard. But I also found something else totally amazing while those who knew they were doing something wrong left, ran away, fled from the temple. Those who would normally hide under the beds when conflict is there, those who may be not even able to move quickly because they're lame or whatever the case might be, they did not leave. Now, in the first case, I'm talking about the children. The children did not leave. Who's the first one to flee a scene when anger erupts? Who's the first one that runs out of the dining room when mom and dad are, are having words with one another? The children. And proverbially, the most safe place in the house is under the bed. They dive under the bed. But these children did not dive under anybody's bed. Instead, they were praising Jesus. And when the leaders come back into the temple, creeping their way back in, now the problem is, is these kids are making too much noise in the house of the Lord. Isn't it amazing how, how a person's mind can be going the wrong directions when God has a message that he wants to share? Jesus prepared for the Passover, told the disciples to go and, and uh, they would find a, 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 a place to, to meet, that, that this place perhaps one that they had used frequently perhaps, upper room is referred to, and we find upper room mentioned later on in scripture as well. So evidently this was not an uncommon thing they went and they prepared for the Passover. It doesn't tell us which ones did it, but they prepared for it. They all came in to the room that evening and they expected someone, a servant, to be there to wash their feet. Last week we had communion. We washed one another's feet. What a blessing. Baptism cleanses us from head to toe, so to speak. And God has cleansed us from the inside out even before baptism. 
But baptism, that outward expression, that witness to people, they, they can see that God has done something and they are, when they are baptized then, it's something very unique, very special. And I know that there are others among you here in this congregation today that desire baptism, either rebaptism or baptism. Please don't be shy. Jesus went around, <laughs> you know the story, <laughs> washing the feet of each of the disciples, came to Peter and, well, we're going to go to Judas before we go to Peter. Judas in his mind, notice what happens. And ask yourself if we do not have some of the qualities even of Judas. As Jesus bowed before him, Desire of Ages tells us that within his mind, he knew what he had done. He was in the process of betraying Jesus, and he knew it was the wrong thing to do. He did it purposely to try to, try, uh, to throw Jesus into the throne, so to speak, to force his hand to do something. But as Jesus knelt there and washed his feet, thoughts both directions happened inside of Judas. Number one, I've done the wrong thing. And as Jesus continues to wash his feet and dry them with a towel, Judas thinks to himself, you know, if he really was the Messiah, there's no way he'd be doing this. And later on left that meal to betray him. Came to Peter. I identify so much with Peter, even though I have Judas tendencies in my heart, and I believe it would be a mistake for any one of us to say we have none of that because that's really the kind of struggles we have with humanity. And the same thing with Peter. Jesus bows before him to wash his feet, and he says, Stop! You will never wash my feet. And Jesus then tells Peter, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part with me. And that's the last thing that Peter wanted to hear. He wanted to be right beside Jesus through anything and everything. And so he responds saying, well, then wash me all over. <laughs> and Jesus said, there's no need. You already took your shower today, Peter. We've been walking here. Our feet are kind of dusty and so forth. But this is symbolic anyway of the cleansing that God wants to do in your heart. The cleansing that God is doing in your heart and mine as well. Jesus institutes the communion service. Uh, this bread represents my body. Eat it. This juice represents my blood to be shed for you. Drink it. And then we find Jesus, they sing a hymn and they go out to the Mount of Olives, to the Garden of Gethsemane. And Jesus praise during that prayer process of time evidently the disciples well Ellen White lays this out pretty clearly that somehow Satan the, a satanic stupor came over them I'm not totally sure what that means but I can tell you this for sure sometimes on a Saturday night I'm wiped out I'll sit there and turn on Pure Flix. I'm not trying to advertise anything, but I want you to know if you're not aware of it, there are good movies on Pure Flix. And I want to thank, well, I'm not going to buy a name here, but somebody in this congregation alerted me to it. And I'll, I'll sit, and I, I want to do nothing. You ever have those kind of times in your life where you, you're, you're wiped out, you just want to do Thing. And so I'll turn this on. I'll start watching a, a movie of, of some, some family who's struggling with some things and, and how God works things out in their lives. But I'm also tired, and pretty soon I fall asleep. The TV continues. The movie continues. By the way, I'm not trying to tell you all you need to go home on Saturday night and watch TV. Please don't misunderstand that. But I want to illustrate something. I want to illustrate something. I'll wake up sometimes at midnight or maybe one o'clock in the morning or two o'clock in the morning and I am almost, how can I say this? There's a stupor that has come over me. It's almost impossible to, to, to rouse myself sufficiently to get up and go to bed. Have you ever felt that? Am I the only one that struggles with that kind of thing? 
And it just seems like there, there, it's an impossibility to, to stand up, to move, to do anything. And so you just, some more. And then finally, you know, you wake up and you think, well, you know, this is ridiculous. Uh, why am I still sitting here on, the, on, the, on, the, on this couch? I, I should be really sleeping where I really should be sleeping. And so I'll force myself to, you know, put the, the footrest down and, and stand up and, and groggily, you know, make my way to the side of the bed and crawl in. And, and then I'm done for the rest of the night, of course. But I'm wondering if that stupor feeling that I have when that kind of thing happens to me might be a little bit similar to what the disciples were experiencing. Because remember, Jesus said, pray with me that you enter not into temptation. Remember that? And Jesus comes back after just anguishing time in prayer with the Father and says, could you not have prayed with me one hour? The Bible says they, Jesus went back to pray and they went back to sleep. I think their intentions were good, but the results were something else, weren't they? The mob came. Judas kissed Jesus because that was going to be the sign that this is the one, as if these Roman officers and, and, and temple uh, police, so to speak, or, or even the, the, the uh, leadership of the Sanhedrin, as if they didn't know what he looked like anyway. And they come and take Jesus. They bind his hands. And you know, no, Peter. <laughs> you know, I, I like Peter because, I don't know, I, I just so, I feel an affinity for him because I open my mouth at the wrong times. I say things I didn't intend to say. Sometimes my, I, my, my mouth opens up and it says things before my brain is in gear to say the right things. And I, I, may, I hope nobody else has that same problem, but I do at times. And then I have to go and apologize for it. Peter draws his sword as they're binding Jesus and they, he, he's ready to take off the, the head of the high priest. And he misses the high priest and takes off the ear of the high priest's servant. Amazing. They've bound his hands already. I wonder what that high priest's servant's feelings were after experiencing the searing pain of the ear being removed and then the, what just happened to me when that ear was replaced? I wonder what happened in the days, the weeks, the months down the road. I wonder if he was one that surrendered his life to Jesus it became a part of the people of the way they take Jesus to the Sanhedrin they do a false trumped up trial on him for him they take him to to uh, Pontius Pilate uh, with the accusations and, and he doesn't like the situation he finds that well let's, let's take him over to Herod because that's his jurisdiction Jesus is scourged he's whipped he's, he's uh, haggard it, it's been a hard long day and comes back to Pilate's room hall um, courtyard I want to do something with you today that I know you're going to feel uncomfortable with but I think the discomfort is a good thing. There's a musical that I've done with children on several occasions. It's called The Jesus Story by Ralph Carmichael. Anybody ever heard of it? Beautiful depiction of the life of Jesus. And when Jesus is in Pontius Pilate's presence, what do the people begin to say? Do you recall? Help me. Crucify him. And it, it builds up to the point where, where it's, just, it's almost a thunderous sound. I want to ask you to say something. I'd like to have you guys over here say, crucify him. And then you guys say crucify him then you guys say crucify him and you guys say crucify him and then let's see what feelings we have as we begin saying those words you have the ability to say that are you willing to give it a try I want you to feel something today 
All right, guys, you ready? Come on, everybody. How do you feel? Yeah, that's the point. That's exactly the point. Ellen White tells us that in reality, demonic forces were there and causing these people to get all wild and, and riled up with this kind of stuff and it became a deafening roar and Pilate felt he had no choice but to grant their wish. Jesus was taken out to Golgotha. Nails were pounded into his hands and feet and he was the cross dropped into that socket in the ground, in the, in the rock, where with great pain and agony, Jesus hung there on the cross. <clears throat> they bound the hands of Jesus in the garden where he prayed they led him through the streets in shame they spat upon the savior so pure and free from sin they said crucify him he's to blame could have called 10,000 angels to destroy the world and set him free. He could have called 10,000 angels, but he died alone. For you and me Upon his precious head They crammed a crown of thorns They laughed and said Behold your king They struck him and they cursed him And mocked his holy name all alone he suffered everything he could have called ten thousand angels to destroy this world and set him free he could have called ten thousand angels but he died alone for you and me when they nailed him to the cross his mother stood nearby he said woman behold thy son He cried, I thirst for water, but they gave him none to drink. Then the sinful work of man was done. He could have called 10,000 angels to destroy this world and set him free he could have called ten thousand angels but he died alone for you and me to the howling mob he yielded he did not for mercy cry the cross of shame he took alone and when he cried it's finished he gave himself 
to die Salvation's wondrous plan was done He could have called 10,000 angels To destroy this world and set him free He could have called 10,000 angels But he died alone For you and me When Adam and Eve sinned, rebelled against God, and the plan of salvation was laid out before them, they realized that their sin would kill the Messiah. When that first lamb was sacrificed and the blood poured from that innocent animal they realized Adam and Eve that they're the ones that were causing this lamb to die when Peter saw what was done to the one that he knew was the Messiah He went to the garden and poured out his heart as well because he realized his own guilt and that he himself was the one who drove the nails in the hands of Jesus. Sermon titled today, I Killed God. When I came to a place in my life where I seriously took a look at what Jesus had done for me on the cross and I recognized that my sin was the reason for his death because he gave his life that I might live. I confess my guilt. I accept his gift. And at that moment is when I killed God. And then came to realize that I have life only because Jesus is the one who gave his life for me in spite of my sin. Where are you today? Are you willing to admit today that you killed God? Or is it something similar to shouting, crucify him? Nobody wants to be responsible for those kinds of things. Nobody wants to be responsible for killing God. But the unique thing about Jesus is that he gave his life for you and for me. Two scripture I want to share with you in closing today. The first comes from Acts chapter 3, our, our scripture for the day. The lame man was healed by the gate beautiful. He runs into the temple proclaiming what a wonderful thing had happened to him. The people ran together. Verse 11. Now was the lame man was healed, uh, who was healed, uh, held on to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them in the porch, which is called Solomon's, greatly, and they were greatly amazed. So when Peter saw it, he responded to the people, when God gives opportunity for you to witness, step up, be a man, be a woman, be a child, step up. And he says, men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? 
Or why look so intently at us as though by our own power or goodness, our godliness, we have made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But you denied the Holy One and the just and asked for a murderer to be granted to you and kill the Prince of Life, whom God raised from the dead, of which we are witnesses. Peter recognized that he had killed God. John recognized that he had killed God. But the bottom line is, they shared with the people their own guilt and gave opportunity for people to respond. When you and I are given opportunity to share and to live for Jesus, and to witness, to let people know that Jesus gave his life on the cross for you and that Jesus is the one that we need to be connecting with and unabashedly sharing with people that he is the one that gave his life for our salvation. What a blessing comes as we share. Notice also what it says in Hebrews chapter 7, verses 25 and 26. Therefore he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For such a high priest was fitting for us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from, separated from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens. Who does not need daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the people's? For this he did once for all, when he offered up himself. The gift of salvation, dear church family, is yours and is mine. But we must accept it. If God is speaking to your heart today and you want to publicly share that Jesus gave his life on the cross for you, you want to recommit your life to Jesus, I want to encourage you Find one of our elders. Speak to me as you go from the sanctuary today and ask for either baptism or rebaptism. I'm not one to press. Please don't misunderstand that. But the opportunity God gives, we need to be open to. I thank God today for helping me to realize that I'm the one who killed Jesus. Because as I realized that, I began to understand better the specialness of the gift.
Father God, as we go into this community following this service today, we will go unprepared and unthankful unless we recognize before we go that I killed you. That each one of us come to realize today that, that we individually are the ones who killed you on the cross. We drove the nails in your hands and feet. We're responsible for the fact that the king of the universe died that day. Lord Jesus, recognizing that makes all the difference in the world. Because now it's no longer me. Now it's no longer individually us, so to speak. But it's all about you. And the message that goes with us as we leave here today is not a message about us. It's a message of thanksgiving for what you have done. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your wonderful gift of salvation. May we learn to appreciate it more. Daily is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.